Across the River Foyle lies the city of Derry. It became Londonderry in 1613 when a royal charter was granted to mark the connection between the city and the merchant companies who sponsored and developed the area. Although it's been 350 years since the name change, it's been a bone of contention ever since. Derry's walls occupy a special place in the history of Ireland. They have helped to shape and form a story that began nearly 400 years ago. The walls are much more than a quaint reminder of the past. In December 1688, the citizens of London Derry faced a crisis. Thirteen apprentice boys closed the gates of the city in the face of troops loyal to King James II. The thinking behind the shutting of the gates simply was this, that the people of Derry had really quite good reason to think that within uh, another two or three days there was to be a massacre of the Protestants. On the ninth day of this month, they are to fall off to kill and murder man, wife and child. This was the famous Cumber letter. And the arrival of those red shanks seemed to fit in exactly. Uh, they had, if there was to be a massacre, maybe the Derry Protestants were to be the first victims and the red shanks were to be their executioners. Do we admit the red shanks of no! They were very nervous about letting them in. Or do we defy the sword of the king and close the gates? No! On the other hand, James was still the king, and the Red Shanks were acting under the authority of his Lord Deputy, so to keep them out was treason. Antrim's men are but a few miles away. Philip urges you not to let them enter, and he does not trust them. They are a disciplined body of men with an even more unruly mob of camp horse behind them. The rebels were the people inside Derry, here you see, because they were really breaking their allegiance to the appointed king. And that's, that, I think, is why there was such confusion about whether the gates should be closed against the Earl of Antrim's regiment. Sir, Church Peter advised us today. We really have reports from the Irish surrounding himself and we searched a rebellion by the priests. Let's let us further proof on a bloody massacre. I say we must not admit them. Oh! Bishop Hopkins uh, went down into the diamond and addressed uh, the people and so on, and he said forthrightly in his sermon, the king is the Lord's anointed, you can't break your allegiance to him, you can't be disloyal to him, no matter what he does to you, no matter what he imposes upon you, your only refuge is to, uh, is to turn to God and say, well, we've got to submit to these things. But we, you know, it's a worse crime, a worse sin to uh, rebel. He warns you to consider seriously whether or not to admit Lord Antrim's man into the city. No, 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 no. And while this argument was going on, the younger people, uh, one of the contemporaries says, who are seldom so dilatory in their actions, they began to murmur and say, you know, stop all this shilly shallying and shut the gates. And finally they did it. On March 12th, 1689, King James himself landed in Ireland. Before long, a Jacobite army marched into Ulster, forcing Protestants from all over the north to retreat to Derry. Troops under the command of Governor Lundy set out to defend the river crossings at Long Causey and Claddyford. Resistance was weak and they were soon put to flight amid rumours that Lundy intended to surrender to the advancing Jacobites. Angered by Lundy's actions, the citizens of Derry forced him to flee the city. Legend has it he made his escape over the walls by climbing down a pear tree. He was replaced as governor by Colonel Henry Baker and the Reverend George Walker, rector of Donoch County, Tyrone. 
Walker is left as the most famous first-hand account of the siege. In his diary, Walker was always ready to cast himself in an heroic role. King James II arrived in front of the city on April 18, 1689. He arrived down here at Bishop's Gate and confidently expected that his appearance would bring about an immediate surrender. The king was wrong. He was startled to be met by cries of no surrender and a volley of shots fired from the walls. One stray cannonball killed an officer next to the king. James decided on the worst of the three military options that he had. The first option was when he got his army here was to immediately storm the city and there's very very little doubt that had he done that the city would have fallen. The second option was to ignore the city and bypass it leaving a small force here to contain the garrison and remove the threat of the garrison. The third and worst option of the lot which James was almost fated to make was the option of laying siege to the city. The um, basic principle of demolishing or breaching a city wall was to try to skip the cannon balls off the top of the walls and then progressively demolish the wall by doing that. It's almost like a, a boy skipping stones off the surface of a pond and uh, obviously once it would have skipped off the wall then it would also have hit buildings behind and caused damage there. The idea really was to create a breach through which uh, the, after the offer of surrender had again been made, a force of infantry which uh, came to be known in military terms as a forlorn hope because they had precious little chance themselves of actually surviving the attack, uh, rushed through and uh, they cleared the way, if you like, for the, the main force which would then have come through and set about uh, fighting with the garrison and the upshot of it all would basically have been that anybody within the walls uh, would have been put to the sword. Many siege relics are housed in St. Columns Cathedral. This uh, particular cannonball, uh, if you like to weigh it, uh, is pretty hefty. Quite heavy. It's fired uh, by deduction from its diameter. It's fired from a gun that was called a demi culverin, uh, which could fire a, a shot of about 10, 12 pounds. Uh, that, in fact, had a range of not much more than 600 yards. There were demi culverins sighted in Strong's Orchard on the east bank of the river, which fired into the city. Uh, there are records of them actually having killed soldiers while marching up uh, Shipkey Street and so forth. But that was just about the extreme range for that particular armament. On the 11th of June, a fleet of 30 ships sailed into Loch Foyle. These ships carried ample stocks of food and 5,000 troops under the command of Major General Percy Kirk. The fleet weighed anchor off Culmore Point and it looked as if the relief of the city was imminent. However, as the days passed, the initial joy of the garrison turned to dismay as it became evident that it was making no attempt to come up river. Then, on the 12th of July, the citizens on the walls were horrified to see that most of Kirk's fleet had disappeared overnight. Kirk's fleet lay in the distance at the mouth of Loch Foyle, within plain sight of where I'm standing here at the top of St. Collins Cathedral. Communication wasn't possible because of the absence of any pre-arranged code or signal. Imagine how they felt within the city when they saw the fleet sail off.
In the last stage of the siege, people were dying in great numbers from hunger, leprosy, fever, and a host of other ailments. Here's an extract from Governor Walker's diary dated July 27th. The garrison is reduced to 4,456 men and under the greatest extremity for want of provision, which does appear by this account taken by a gentleman in the garrison of the price of food. Horse flesh sold for one shilling and eightpence per pound. A quarter of a dog was five shillings and sixpence. These were fattened by eating the bodies of the slain Irish. A dog's head was two shillings and sixpence. A cat, four shillings and sixpence. A rat, one shilling. And you could buy a mouse for sixpence. At least 10,000 inhabitants of Derry died during the siege, most of them from disease, which always breaks out when people are starving and cramped and overcrowded. Uh, and many, many thousands of the Irish army also died, uh, again, mostly by disease, or some were killed by shot and shell and so on. Uh, I think it's quibbling to say that wasn't really a siege. At the end of July, Kirk's fleet returned to the foil under orders to attempt to break the boom which blocked the river. On the evening of 28th of July, two supply ships, the Phoenix and the Mountjoy, set sail. The Mountjoy rammed the boom, was forced back and grounded. It was attacked by the Irish and freed itself only by the recoil of its own cannon. In the meantime, the Phoenix slipped through the breach, followed closely by the Mountjoy. They were supported by the warship Dartmouth, and soon the boom was broken and supplies were on their way to the starving garrison. With the boom shattered, the Irish army realised that their last chance of starving the garrison into submission was gone. By the morning, they had struck camp. After 105 days, the siege of Derry was over. But what is its significance today? It's twofold, at least. The first is its effect upon subsequent British history, which we talked about earlier, that if Derry had surrendered, it is possible that James would have won that war and the Stuarts would be reigning today. But who can say? I think that's uh, on the world stage. That's the significance. The other significance is its effect on what you might call the folklore of Ulster history. Its effect as a rallying point to Protestants and the pride, a sense of pride they have in the achievements of the defenders of Derry. Um, and uh, it, it's become a sort of symbol of the whole of Ulster, in a way, a besieged city, a besieged province. Uh, no surrender. In 1689, the Protestant people of Londonderry feared betrayal. This fear arose from the actions of Governor Lundy. Every year, the apprentice boys construct and burn him in effigy. Lundy is one of the most potent images of the siege. His effigy is 16 feet tall and weighs over a ton. He's slowly right. 
Point of Bray, right? Hold it, hold it! Pull it, pull it! Gordon, hold it! Somebody get out, Gordon. Right, punch it around, will you? Okay. Yes, sir. Forward. 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 Go ahead, everybody. Forward. Forward. When the apprentice boys make their effigy of Lundy and they set fire to him and they talk about the traitor Lundy and so on, in a sense this is a kind of ritual purgation of guilt. He's so convenient a scapegoat. Somebody has to be blamed. Somebody has to be the Lundy. And in each recurring situation on the, in the Protestant cycle of siege and feeling besieged, they look around at each other and they say, there's someone who can't be trusted. There's someone who's going to be weak. There's someone who's going to go over to the other side or to criticize us for what we're doing. And therefore, in a sense, the collective guilt is focused upon him. So he hangs, swaying in the breeze, all dressed up with nowhere to go. A lonely Lundy awaits his annual execution. There's a tug of war between Protestant politics and Catholic politics for Ireland. The Republic of Ireland consists of only part of the island. Northern Ireland consists of only part of the island, and that, that part, by the will of the majority, is still part of the United Kingdom, and therefore is under British sovereignty. Now, it seems to me because that division between Protestant and Catholic within Northern Ireland is one over sovereignty, it's the same kind of decision that people were having to make in 1689 as to who was king, really, which king they were choosing. Um, it's, in that sense, I mean, it's, it's still going on. It had an enormous effect upon the uh, the sort of folklore beliefs of the, the Protestant, the Unionists of Derry. It'll never be forgotten for that reason. And nor, nor should it be forgotten, though not destined for that reason, because it was, as we said earlier, it is, was and is the most famous siege in British history. Mm -hmm. 